Uh, okay, this is a, a product of two, two, I guess, instances of research. Uh, the first one I presented at OWASP London maybe a year ago or so, I can't remember. And then this is how we utilize some of that research to take it to the next level. So I'm going to do a quick summary of what originally happened and then all the bad stuff that we did afterwards, which is more entertaining. Uh, this is a combination of two people. So I'm Steve Jaguer. Azzy Greenhalts is currently right now at B-Sides Tel Aviv today doing the same thing. So we're scaling. Uh, this is me. Um, I was, you can see I have, I, I live in England. I was born Canadian and I was super happy when I got in here because I thought I'm going to Lisbon. And I arrived yesterday and it was raining <laughs> and it was 27 degrees and sunny in England. I said, what the fuck? <laughs> it's good today, though. It'll be fine. Uh, I've been writing code for a long time. I've gone through various forms of security in terms of Kubernetes, supply chain. Supply chain is this, containers. I've got the Kubernetes security certifications. If you find yourself in London, uh, I run DevSecOps London Meetup. We've got over 3,000 members every third, third Wednesday of every month. Uh, it's usually next to Sam Stepanian's OWASP. We try to get them side by side on a Wednesday and a Thursday. And I also have a show every second Friday called Wired In uh, that we were basically myself and one of my ex-colleagues complain about security for about half an hour. Oh, I also like beer. Yay. All right. Rhetorical question. I am sure everyone here, yes, good. I'm, all your hands should be up. You know you use GitHub. I know you all use open source. This is OWASP. You love open source. Um, I'm sure you also know what GitHub Actions are. In the incredibly unlikely event you don't know what a GitHub Action is, GitHub's introduced their own CI CD. It's got workflows that allow you to do just about anything in terms of automating, build, test, etc. There is also a marketplace that when I screen captured this, there was over 19,000 perfectly safe actions that you can add to your workflows to do whatever you would like to make things faster, better, and uh, you just don't have to worry about those. Nobody's doing anything bad in there. There are some attack vectors that our GitHub repositories are susceptible to. Repo jacking, NPM email hijacking if it's an NPM, and command injection. Command injection was, whoa, that's louder. Command injection was the first bit of research we did. How, what, how many forms of command injection could we utilize? And then we extended it into NPM email hijacking and repo jacking. And repo jacking turned out to be the most fruitful with GitHub Actions for a very specific reason. I'm going to talk about, about these now. Repo jacking is if you have a repository, uh, and I was explaining to Sam earlier, because he couldn't be here today, what I meant by this. Say, the example I used was, there's a great open source tool called Trivi. Trivi was written by uh, this guy named Tepe. So his namespace for the open source was Tepe and Trivi. But then Aqua Security bought him, essentially, and his open source. And now Trivi lives in the Aqua Security domain. Which means anybody who had a dependency on Trivi in his GitHub namespace it's now somewhere else. Now that doesn't break anything because GitHub automatically will forward all those references, which is cool. But it does mean that the namespace where Trivia used to be may not be there anymore, and that's all fine. Because even if it goes away, GitHub remembers the reference and will automatically forward to the new location. Cool. What if I were to figure out what this was and I can now create Tepe, create a new user, and then create the repository with the exact same name that used to be there. Well, you can try and do it, but GitHub puts something in place that it will retire the namespace of a project that has had more than 100 clones in the week leading up to the owner's account being renamed or deleted, etc. Cool. Sounds good, unless it's a GitHub action repository. If it's a normal repository, you clone it. If it's an action, you're just downloading an asset. That's not a clone. So in the case where this is an action and the action has moved, there's nothing stopping you from creating this, including GitHub. Because there won't be any, unless there happens to be clones, but more often than not, there isn't. So that is what we started looking for. 
and very successfully found plenty of examples. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, if you're unsure about NPM email hijacking, it's pretty straightforward. You parse the package log JSON of a repository. You go get the information about the package name. You can do it like this. And actually, the only live demo, if I dare, is that. Ooh. Ooh, it didn't work. All right. That's why you don't do live demos. You can just, you can go get it, pipe it to JQ, get maintainers, and you'll get the email address of whoever maintains that NPM. You can then script a check of the domain. If the domain doesn't exist, or it's changed, or something's wrong with it, you can then register the domain, et cetera, et cetera. And send a mail server, reset the maintainer's password, and presto, you own that particular NPM. Again, surprisingly vulnerable uh, example of how to get involved. NPM does this credit to NPM. They do periodically check to see if the maintainer accounts don't exist, and if so, um, they disable the account, but they don't do it fast enough because there's a lot of NPM packages. Example of command injection. This is what, some of the work we did last year. We just went looking all over GitHub for examples where any of the GitHub metadata was being used in a workflow. And if it was being used in a workflow, we checked to see if we could do anything about it. This was incredibly common. There was even an example in a workflow where when an issue was created, somebody was creating a blog page out of the issue and with all the details. And they're like, well, that is horrible, because now I can put anything I want. The issue title is incredibly long. So if I were to do, let's see if this breaks or not. Fingers crossed, great. So say I take that issue check, I've got that as a workflow. Or I got my malicious friend, Assy, to create and be a contributor to a particular project. And it's going to make sure that all my issues have the correct naming convention. Cool. And then I go in, innocently, and create a new issue. You can see my little face up there. And I paste my appropriate title with a backtick. And all of you Linux lovers will know what that means. And this is where I'm going to cutting and pasting. If you wonder why it's going so slow. And by the way, the reason I've recorded this is because I did this live once, and somebody worked out that this is an actual repository and then started messing with me during. I respected it. <laughs> so I create the issue, and it's going to run environment variables. It's going to curl that all the way out to my webhook.site. It's going to run the issue check, and voila, command injection occurs and I can export all the environment variables, and now I have them all in my world. Cool. That's just like one very simple example that got us started. I thought, all right, how many, how many, if this was a self-hosted runner, this would be pretty bad. It's already bad that it's a GitHub runner. A few other examples, dependency confusion. I can, I can just try and create something that looks like another repository. Uh, the malicious pull request as an insider was a poison pipeline execution. Um, the, pro the, the fun thing about GitHub is that if I've contributed even just once, like a readme file, doesn't have to be anything, and the repository is set up with its defaults, then it will run a workflow that I commit. And it will execute the workflow if the commit is in fact a workflow. It, it's like a chicken and the egg scenario. It hasn't been approved yet, and yet because it, it's a file in the workflow directory, it will just execute it. Of course, if I'm not, it will say, well, do you want to approve and run this workflow? And there'll be a button that stops, you, you know, is security. What's interesting is it, where it says improve and run, there's actually some, some detail there saying, suggesting you should always run because all of your security checks are in workflows. So like, it's, it's kind of a, what do I call it? Negative reinforcement of something you shouldn't do. There, this help up here, four and five, where it does say, be alert to propose changes to the GitHub workflows directory if that's part of the pull request or part of the commit, because it will run the workflow. Of course, don't need to read this. You have to click to learn more. It doesn't tell you that. So the reality is this is the default, and this is what it should be, require approval for all outside contributors. It should be like that, but that's not the way every almost every GitHub repository is set up. So an example of one other one we tried was creating a pull request with a curl 
There's enough information inside the workflow in terms of metadata, and you can see it all here. Event number is the pull request. Repository, it's all there. That I could submit a pull request that approves itself. But that's only before March 2023. Because of this experiment, GitHub changed this. So that when you create a repository now, this GitHub token doesn't have the ability to do this anymore. It's essentially a read-only token. Every repository that was created before March 2023 has a full rewrite cap read write capability. So you can do an awful lot with a GitHub token if a repository was created before 2023, which is still about 95% of all repositories and open source projects that are out there, including the OWASP ones. Here's an example of where I'm gonna do just about everything I want. So I've got, I'm gonna curl out all of the secrets that I can see within the workflow. I'm gonna get the environment variables, and then I'm gonna do this nasty little thing down here. Uh, anyone want to shout out if you can figure out what I'm doing? Yes. So because I've already contributed and changed the readme, if I were to do a pull request with that in it, you can see I'm already starting a netcat up here on a different server. I, you can probably see that I've got my web.site created. I'm going to create my workflow here into this repository. I would recommend not calling your YAML file pwn.yaml. It's probably pretty obvious, but for the purposes of this, it's fine. And big CI was the, is the name of my workflow, and it's running. Nothing's happened. It's never been approved. Oh, it was approved, but it's been, if, it, if it dropped down, you could see that it's approved by the GitHub Actions bot, so it looks really good already. And... All three of those things are now going to run in a repository. I have the GitHub token there. I have the environment variables there. And if I push back over to here, you can see that now I have a reverse shell. Now, I'm, it's a little cut off, but you can see it. So now I'm on a GitHub runner. How long can I sit on this GitHub runner? There is a timeout. So if there's anything I want to do, I'm going to have to make sure I get it done quick, right? so that it doesn't time out and kick me out. Uh, I made my uh, environment a little nicer uh, with a bit of Python there. The dangerous thing about most runners is that there's just too much stuff. Even the GitHub runners, have there's just too much default um, software installed on them. If there was a self-hosted runner, which you should never do that, by the way. You should never use self-hosted runners for open source projects. There are thousands and thousands of people doing that, but it's bad because you have a tendency to assume in the soft inner of your runner that no one would ever be there like this. So I just blasted through a little script that I ran on the runner, and you see now my pull request is closed. I did that all from on the runner. So now the pull request won't time out. And in addition to that, if I try and look at what happened inside the, uh, inside the pull request, I've done a lot more than just, you can probably see this little guy down here. There's no files anymore, so no one can see that I actually tried to put something malicious on there. And if I hover over that, I've got a little wave high from Linus Torvalds in there now. So I've changed the commit as well. And because, I'm, because they don't force signed commits, like nobody forces signed commits, you can impersonate anybody by changing the git config which I did from on their own server. And I'm still here, and it's still alive. So now I've kind of circumvented the timeout as well. So the, even though the workflow is not running anymore, I'm still on the server, which is weird, right? I did a who am I to see that I was runner, which is a user that is, doesn't have a whole lot of capability, and I'm unsatisfied with that. Uh, I didn't fix the recording. Clear doesn't work in my terminal, so ignore that. I'm going to run a Docker command. Uh, and if you're familiar with this Docker command, it's great. It's the best and worst Docker command ever. Because Docker is running as root, all I did was self-break out of myself by through one command so that I could escalate to root. So that's where that ends, is that now I'm a root on whatever runner this is. That was the end of the first bit of research, to work out how many different ways we could do repo jacking, NPM hijacking, and how many different ways and things we could do in terms of command injection. And then we thought, okay, well, we looked at a lot of repositories, and there's not that many that we could abuse. There was a lot. 
We thought, well, what if I want to extend my reach? How do I work my way upstream to dependencies? And we found that the repo jacking didn't work on straight up dependencies, but it would work on GitHub action dependencies. So we started looking at what GitHub actions used other GitHub actions. And we created a, this massive Neo4j dependency tree, not of dependencies the software that was being built was using, dependencies that the actions that were doing the building had. Because actions are little programs themselves. They use containers, they use other actions, and it was pretty deep. Our goal was to find something far upstream that we could attack using one of the other methods, and then work our way down through a chain of actions so we could get to a repository that had things we actually wanted. And how far away would we have to go to make that happen? Because there would have to be flaws in every repository, and the GitHub token would have to be rewritten, every single one. We're like, surely this isn't possible. But we wrote a script that would do that. We got the top 10,000 repositories on GitHub by stars, so the most popular ones. And of course, we got 32,000 repositories of companies with bug bounties because we like to get paid for our research. We filtered all the ones that didn't use GitHub Actions. That was pretty easy. We got about 7,000 in the end. Then we started cloning the repositories, checking for our attack vectors, grabbing met metadata, seeing if the GitHub Action the GitHub token did what we needed, and loop from there. One example, we found one initial repository that allowed us to infect 18 other repositories that allowed us to extract secrets from 72 downstream repositories. So success, it worked. You're probably thinking, how do we keep going down? I'll talk about that in a moment. Of the 7,000, if you're wondering, 175, we didn't have to get fancy. They just worked directly. And we, and we, could, we could attack those and get those secrets. So that's fine, using any of the methods we talked about. Some of the directly vulnerable repositories, which are no longer vulnerable because all of this has been disclosed, but it's fun to name and shame, were these. In particular, a particular example that I'm going to talk about, we were able to infect one action that was, Veracode was depending on a wonderful security company. They fixed it, so this is no longer a problem anymore. But Veracode was being used by Hangfire. Hangfire was producing a NuGet package. The NuGet package had almost 10,000 daily downloads, and we were able to own that NuGet package using exactly this method. I think approximately what, almost 12,000. So we, we found a way by infecting a far upstream action that depended on an action that depended on an action that we could crawl all the way down to attack nearly 12,000 repositories. Again, everybody knows this. Unlike in the previous talk, uh, the, everybody responded very well and everything has been fixed. Nobody ignored us, which was awesome. So last quick demo of how this actually works, which is interesting, is I'm going to get a repository that has an action that has an action that has an end repository. And I'm going to push code. I'm going to overwrite a tag, and I'm going to steal secrets. And that is something that we created, called a worm effectively, that repeats itself and keeps overwriting tags until it gets where it wants to be. All right, we plan? Great. So over here, I've got my website with a malicious payload ready and waiting. I'm attacking my first action, so I've found one of my methods to, so that I can run a workflow. The workflow is going to contact me over here. It's gonna do a Python pip install, and it's gonna run my demo. So simply by checking that in, you can see that this action is being used in here, in a dependent repository. So really now that I've got, I've changed my action code, so it's going to run something I want to do and download my own payload, I just need in here to be able to get my repository to run the workflow, my dependent workflow, or a dependent workflow. So if you have a keen eye, you can see that there's an action called reverse the date that gets to another action that goes to another. I've got all my tabs in order here. 
And then the org is the very last one that I wanted to try and get secrets out of. You can also see that they've tagged the release of their action as v1, which is great. And I'm just going to do an update to the readme, because the readme will trigger the execution of my workflow, which is cool. There we go. So my workflow has been downloaded. It's executing my payload, and two things are going to happen. Well, one, I push the GitHub token back out to my command and control. But more importantly, if we look at the tag, I've now changed the workflow in the destination repository to have the exact same code. So now if you can imagine, I changed one action, the action was used by a repository later on, I then overwrote the tag with a force commit to add the same download of the same malicious code again. So now when, it, when its dependency is modified, again, by changing a readme, I just need to wait. Every repository in the chain, as we saw, is eventually going to run their workflows. And when they run the workflows, they will download my payload. I will then change the action workflow for that and wait for the next dependency to run and use that action. So essentially, the worm is slowly crawling its way downstream through the dependent actions until I eventually get to the, the end repository, which is where I am now. And I've got the shh, don't tell anyone secret from the final repository. So it was just a case of creating a clever worm, overwriting a tag that is not protected, so therefore changing the code associated with that tag, and doing that on repeat, but doing it at such a scale that eventually we found that there were enough vulnerable repositories that we could get to the end. And it worked, which was great. Now, a lot had to be wrong for this to work. It's very, very easy to stop it. If you just set the GitHub token or personal access token, whatever, to read only, then it wasn't going to work. Simple. But because so many repositories don't have that set and continue to not have that set, that was, that made it vulnerable. There should be branch protection rules that stop us from doing some of the things we tried to do. If you have branch protection turned on, great, but you really should go look at all of the things in branch protection because almost everything should be turned on and almost nothing is. In, in fact, the default reviewers in branch protection is one, and you've already seen that for an older repository, I can, I can approve myself. Use protected tags so that only certain people can change, update, delete tags. Now, that doesn't happen by default. You, again, in one of these insecure by default GitHub repository settings where protected tags isn't just turned on. I wouldn't have been able to do that if this was a protected tag. You should definitely limit outbound connections from runners. GitHub default runners don't do that. Hopefully, if you're using a self-hosted runner, you do, but more often than not, it's not. I shouldn't be able to curl out from inside a runner, but we could over and over again. You should always pin an action using the hash. There's a really, uh, there's an open source tool called GAT, G-H-A-T, and you can run it, you can, you can, Clone your repository, look at your workflow, just run GAT on it, and it changes all your tags to hash. If any of these had used the hash, my overwriting of the tag wouldn't have worked because it would have still been referring to the original hash. So that would have prevented it. However, most of the time, if you go to Marketplace and you choose whatever actions you want, it adds it based on tag, not based on hash. Oh, and there's GAT. I was trying to remember who wrote it. I put it in here, James Wolfenden. Uh, definitely recommend it. It's super easy, um, and it's, it makes you wildly more secure. A lot of this is actually in the GitHub Security Lab actions permissions. Like, it tells you what you should do. It seems 99% people, of people don't actually go read that. Uh, last thing I will mention and shout out to is um, OpenSSF have a free scorecard. If you don't ever use it, it's great. It only does check your repository. 
One of the outcomes of this, I guess you'd say malicious um, scripting, is now we're looking at seeing what we just did to build that Neo4j to see if we can do the opposite and build a open source project that does the same graph and looks to see if anything upstream can be vulnerable on your project. It's not done yet, but it's hopefully coming soon. Uh, and I think that is the end. It only took half an hour. Perfect. Any questions on what I said? Uh, maybe it was clear, maybe it wasn't. I've only done this presentation once. <laughs> cool. I consider no. Oh, the, ah, it's always one. Easy ones, please. When you prevest from the runner, is it by design that you could prevest the Docker command, or is it something that is going to be or that has been fixed? No, if it's a self uh, a GitHub runner by default has Docker installed on it. I mean, and, and they know that, so it's not like it's a bug. It's just a very abusable feature. Um, most self-hosted runners, including, because I worked at Bridge Crew, Bridge Crew uh, had a nice open source project called Checkoff. We were one of the, those guilty of using a self-hosted runner on an open source project. Um, and that is what prompted the beginning of this research was to see how badly could someone abuse what we were doing. And it turned out to be quite bad because we had Docker installed on ours and that went away. Cool. In three, two, oh, here we go. Getting a question from a guy wearing a t shirt that says adversary. That's intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any more recommendations on limiting outbound traffic from runners? Because uh, I suspect that many actions pull some packages, NPM or, or so, for, uh, for the things that they do. And I guess there's also kind of a DNS exfil, probably. Uh, you, well, you generally know where you're expecting to pull from. Um, I would even say that, I, and something I don't have an advice in here, is your workflows, if it's GitHub, should have like a code owner's file in it so that only certain people can modify it. That would have been another good thing. So, because then I couldn't modify or even submit a workflow at all. Um, so that's for starters. It means only certain people can modify workflows. And if only certain people can do that, then those people will know the actions they've chosen. And you've got a little bit more control over that. And therefore, then you can open up outbound connections to the right, certainly to the GitHub domain, and, and but not anything else. So you can be sensible about it. Yeah, but there's no standard functionality or anything? Uh, oh, no, no. The... No, and there's no standard functionality. <laughs> no, insecure by default. That's how we do things. <laughs> Uh, anyone else? Hi. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a question for this moment, but uh, I was paying close attention to the demo because I've already watched, I think, a similar version to, to of this talk. Mm -hmm. Made by uh, another Palo Alto Networks uh, researcher on the concept of the worm itself. Yeah, um, and I was uh, paying really close attention to the demo, and I was really mesmerized by that Docker uh, command that you ran because that was basically just a one-liner. Uh, yeah, privilege, pri privilege escalation attack that yeah. just gave you root, and I was just like uh, kind of confused on how that worked. So uh, okay, well, the Docker command topic it, for now, or if you could like uh, talk about that later. Uh, if you want to LinkedIn me or something, uh, my name's very weird, even though it's short. It's pretty easy to find me. So just connect to me, and if you want, send me a message saying, "Hey, how's that Docker? How's it work?" I'll send you the command if you want, and you can have fun with it as well. Do you have some statistics about how many of those main actions that are used, for example, not only the official one, but for example, the one that are from big organization, let's say AWS and so on, and that don't use internally uh, ash, you know, when they point to the actions? Because why I'm asking that is that for organization in that case, we will often have 
the case for the GitHub token will not just be a read only like token. We might need like to have a read and write rest of the permission. And what I'm afraid of is that even if your developers put the hash on the direct action that they use, if then those actions rely on other actions, mm -hmm. don't put the hash, then you can end up also being compromised here. Right. That's exactly right. Uh, we do have stats, but I don't have them um, on what what where used what actions. Um, I can try and get them if you want to connect to me again. I can try if you're curious about a specific um, set of dependencies. That that would be fine. We, I'm pretty sure we have it. Um, the reason open source was in brackets in the title is because. It's not just open source. I mean, everybody uses open source. Like 80% of your code is open source. Even if you're a commercial product, somewhere there's probably an upstream action that connects to your commercial product. So that's why it's in brackets, which is what you're alluding to is that just about everything has this as a vulnerability if we dug deep enough. Now we tried to, the reason we did the top 10,000 stars is because those are the most used ones and we created the map based on there and we basically told everybody. So it's, the world should be a safer place now, I would hope, but it's still a, it's still a possibility. Just going back to the Docker in Docker stuff, in root, so you are getting root on the runner, or you are escaping outside of the runner, because on a runner you can just sudo and you are root. Can you? Yes. You just did it? Yes. Oh, did I do that? Okay. We can talk afterwards. I'm going to find out that I just did something the hard way, aren't I? But the command is still cool. Yes. <laughs> we good? Awesome. Thanks. <laughs>